So, uh, we're going to now talk about joint probability distributions and random samples. And the idea of this chapter is, while it's nice to have random variables by themselves, in and of themselves, it's natural to want to talk about how two or more random variables are related to each other. So, we'll start this chapter by talking about the bivariate situation talking also a little bit about multivariate situations, but we don't need to pay too much attention to that. Um, but we have at least two random variables, x and y. We're going to ask if these random variables are correlated or uncorrelated or even independent. Uh, supposedly, we're getting... Uh, what we're getting with these random variables are so things from the sample space, and then both of these random variables are jointly defined on the same sample space and they return some numbers uh, based on whatever it is you drew from the sample space. And these could be related in some ways. And we're going to study, uh, well, we're going to see how to investigate two random variables relationships. But we'll also be considering larger collections of random variables, such say uh, x1 to xn. And in this situation, those random variables could very well be thought of as being a, uh, a random sample from a population. So actually each variable is uh, thought of as an observation, but uh, we're now kind of moving away from probability back into statistics territory, but now with the tools that prob probability gave us. So we get to talk about observations as random variables. In chapter one, we were talking about observations, but those were things that we saw. Now we get to study the behavior of statistics when we're viewing observations as random variables, which we haven't necessarily seen yet. And we're going to be studying the properties of those random variables. And there are things such as, well, we have general a general notion of statistics. Uh, a statistic T is a function of your data set, but we're viewing the statistic now as being a random variable. For instance, if the sample mean is computed from random numbers, then the sample mean itself is a random number. So we should be viewing it as a random variable. If it is a random variable, then it has a distribution. Um, and we want to study the properties of those distributions, like the mean of the sample mean. Uh, so the mean of a statistic, the expected value of a statistic, its variance, uh, its uh uh, probably mass function or probably density function or it's CDF, all those things we would be quite interested in in, in uh, investigating because this will help us decide uh, what statistics we should be using to learn about uh, populations from samples. <coughs> so it is basically in this chapter where our probability theory starts to turn into statistics. And we come back to statistics after our long foray into probability theory. I'm going to start out with section one on jointly distributed random variables. In this chapter, in this section, well, actually in this entire chapter, I assume that you know multivariate calculus, which if you're taking classes at the University of Utah is calculus three, which is math 12, no, 2210. And that is not a prerequisite for this course. So why am I assuming that you know it? Well, the reason why is because I made a video that gives students an introduction to multivariate calculus and should give them what they need in order to be able to follow along on this video. So if you have not taken a calculus three course, if you're not familiar with multivariate calculus, if you don't know how to compute integrals with multiple variables, stop right now, go watch that video. You could probably, if you if you're really pinched for time, uh, you could probably skip to the part on integration. Um, if you're less pinched for time, but really don't want to have to spend too much time, you could probably skip the part on differentiation too. Um, the first, because how that video is organized is the first part is just introducing the notion of working with multivariate functions. And that's the first part. The second part is about multivariate differentiation because it feels like a natural thing to discuss next. Students are pretty familiar with first learning about differentiation in, in calculus and then integration. So I wanted to say something about it. Although that said, I'm not sure how much we're going to be using it here. 
Uh, and uh, after that is multivariate integration, which is basically the reason why I made the video. So you should at the very least watch that. I am aware uh, that the last problem that I solved on that video, I think I got an incorrect number in the end. I think I got a negative number, which is obviously wrong because the thing that I was integrating was non-negative everywhere. So it's impossible in such a situation to end up with a negative integral. So that may have been an error. It was a really long video and that integral was really hard. So like by the time I was at that video, which you can see was uh, just me sprinting through it, I was absolutely exhausted. But long story short, you need to go watch that part before you watch this because I'm going to assume that you know how to how to do multivariate calculus. Uh, all right. If, if you don't already know multivariate calculus, if you've already taken calculus three, then you can probably skip that video entirely. Okay, so uh, section one, jointly distributed random variables. Suppose X and Y are two discrete random variables. So we're gonna start out with the discrete case. Um, so their joint probability mass function is described uh, below. So their joint probability mass function which is going to be called P of X, Y is going to equal the probability that capital X is equal to little X and uh, capital Y is equal to little Y, the apostrophe meaning and essentially. So this, this translates to um, and, um, or if we wanted to, we could write this in terms of our set notation. It's the set where X is equal to little X intersected with the set where y is equal to little y. That's another way to think about this. Uh, so that's how we're defining it. And you can probably see now why I'm quite fond of writing little x and little y because now we have two random variables, big x and big y, and writing little x, little y helps keep track of what goes where. So uh, if we want to compute the probability that these two random variables, which we can consider as a tuple, right? We can put them together into a tuple and we're asking for, or as an ordered pair, uh, as a point on a plane, we can ask what is the probability that these random variables are a member of some set uh, or some event? What is the probability that an event occurs where these end up in some event? Uh, maybe if you like pictures, we can think of it as uh, here are, I can put, uh, let's see, uh, let's put, no, black dots are fine. We'll write down black dots, and the black dots represent possible values uh, for the, these random variables. And what we want to know is whether the pair of the random variables ends up in the red circle. So the red circle would correspond with our event A, right? And we wanna know what is the probability that both of these random variables together, because together they are an ordered pair, what is the probability that they end up in that event? And the way we would do that is, well, this is a probability mass function, so what we're gonna do is just add up uh, the points of the, pro or add up the values of the probability mass function where its inputs are in that set. So we can say that the probability uh, that the ordered pair x y is in some or is uh, in some set. That's going to be the sum of the probability mass function uh, over which that or over all combinations that are in that set. Uh, so all ordered pairs for which you have prob uh, positive probability in that set. So you can imagine, uh, maybe, maybe here's another way to kind of understand it. Um, I'm going to write down a plane that corresponds to possible values of X and Y we could get. I'm going to say, so for each point, I'm gonna write down the probability of getting that point, All right? So we could have, for example, point one, point five, point four points oh that's 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 it so let's not do point four uh let's do point three and uh so that's uh point nine so far so we got 
0.05 here and 0.05 here. So the literal position of the numbers in this illustration uh, correspond to the probability of getting that combination of X and Y. So I'll put little X's just to make that even clearer. And then if we wanted to compute the probability of being in some set A, we would just, uh, so let's say that this is the event A, we would add up the probabilities of of the uh, or uh, we would add up the probability mass function at the points where those points are in the event a so that would correspond to uh, so in this case the probability that x y is in the event a is going to be or in the set a is going to be um, 0.1 plus 0.5 plus 0.3, which is equal to 0.9. That's one way you could think about what I'm trying to say here. Uh, so from here, if we wanted to, we can compute marginal probability mass functions because, yeah, we have a joint distribution, but we do still care about what the distribution of X is and what the distribution of Y is. So to get the distribution of just x alone, regardless of whatever y is, what we would do is sum up the probability mass function um, over, over y, wherever the probability mass function uh, is non-zero, which I'm often going to just abbreviate this as y. So sum up over y, the probability mass function. And to get the marginal probability mass function for y, that's going to be the sum of the probability mass function over x, uh, or, or across x for that particular y. So uh, you should probably say that in this situation, the y value is fixed. It does. It isn't changing, and in this situation, the x value is fixed. Uh, here's an illustration of what you're doing when you're. Oh, I guess this was supposed to go on the next page. Okay. Anyway, <laughs> um, here's an illustration of what it is that you're doing. You can alternatively imagine that this um, uh, probability mass a joint probability mass function is a table of probabilities. So we can maybe have 0, 1, 2, 3 as possible values for uh, x and possible values of y are 0, 1, 2. And in this table we have uh, probabilities. So let's see. Let's do 0 0.05, 0 0.1, 0 uh, 0.15, 0, uh, 0.1. So I've got 0 0.2, 0 0.35, 0 0.4, uh, 0 0.2, so now I'm at 0.6, and we'll do 0 0.7, uh, 0 0.9, uh, 0 0.10, or, or point, uh, 1.0, so we'll put 0 here and 0 here. So I've just kind of bootstrapped together um, a joint probability mass function understood as a table, and what and these are called marginal probabilities because you could imagine summing up over the margins and that will get you uh marginal uh marginal probability mass functions like for example if we in order to get the probability mass function for y alone we would sum across the columns to get its probability mass function alone so that would be that's suggesting that the probability that y equals 0 is going to be 0.05 plus 0 0.1 plus 0.15. So that's going to be 0.3. And the, probability, uh, and the probability that y is equal to 1 is going to be the sum over the second row. So that would be 0 0.2 plus 0 0.1, which is 0 0.3. And the probability that y is equal to 3 is going to be the sum of the last, last row, which is going to be uh, 0.4. So we sum up and get a margin sum because we're summing in the margin of this table to get the individual probability mass function for y. Now, if we want to do, 
So notice that what we are adding up is across the y's, which is what this is saying. Okay, another way to think of this is like when you're saying that the probability that y is equal to, um, oh wait, uh, sorry, I was not summing up over the y's, I was summing up over the x's right here. Um, anyway, um, the probability that uh, y is equal to little y is equal to um, the probability that y equals little y and x is any number. So, okay, so maybe I should move this because I'm running out of room. Uh, the probability that uh, y equals little y is equal to the probability that y equals little y and x is any number any number at all. So we're going to add up all the possible values that X could take, but keep the Y fixed in our uh, joint probability mass function in order to compute that probability. So we would end up summing. So in order to do, so in order to compute the probability that Y is equal to little Y and X is any number, you're going to sum up the probability mass function, the joint probability mass function over all possible values of X. Okay, um, and uh, let's give an illustration of computing uh, the margin sum or the the marginal probability for uh, the random variable x. So this will be p x x. So that would be. Um, so now y is what's allowed to vary since you're not fixing y anymore. So the probability that x is equal to zero is the probability that x is equal to zero and y is equal to zero, plus the probability that x is equal to zero and y is equal to one, plus the probability that x is equal to zero and y is equal to two, which are these three numbers. And that's going to be 0.15. And then it would be, so what's the probability that x is equal to one? That's the probability that x is equal to one and y is equal to zero. x is equal to one and y is equal to two. And x is equal to zero and y is equal, or sorry, one, and then the last one. So we're going to have uh, 0.3 and what is the probability that x is equal to 2? Well it's the probability that x is equal to 2 and y is equal to 0 plus the probability that x is equal to 2 and y is equal to 1 plus the probability that x is equal to 2 and y is equal to 2. So that's going to be 0.35 and last one will be uh, 0.2. So that adds up. So notice by the way that everything adds up to 1. So you still need to have for a joint probability mass function that all that it adds up to one. This is still a necessity. So you must have uh, must have that the sum over all possible combinations x and y of the probability mass function is going to be one. That's still required. Okay, all right. Uh, so hopefully that makes some sense. Notice again that this is a this was computed in the margin, hence the term marginal distribution, because what we end up with is a probability mass function for x. Okay, <coughs> sorry. Uh, we can also compute what are known as conditional probability mass functions. So a conditional probability mass function represents the probability di uh, probability distribution of y when we know that x is equal to little x. So it's the value of y given what the value of x is. So it, this allows us to think about what are the relationships among these random variables. So it would correspond basically to if we knew uh, that say, so if, if basically we were forced to live in a world where y is equal to zero, what would then be the distribution of x? And you know from you know from uh, your earlier studies on conditional probabilities that in order to be able to talk about this, we need to divide by the probability that y is equal to zero, and that will renormalize um, everything so that we can that so that will cause a renormalization that causes this row to add up to one, right? 
after you've divided by how much it is, and then you have, after that, a distribution for x. So for instance, if we knew that y is equal to zero, y equals zero, we know that the probability that x is equal to zero would be zero, right? So the probability that x is equal to zero in general is 0.2, but if you knew that y was zero, then x cannot be zero, or cannot be zero with positive probability, because the probability of getting that combination is zero. And similarly, um, let's see. Uh, huh. Well, I, I mean, there's you. You can probably read a few things from this. Um, hmm. Uh, how could I? How could I think about this? What's another example? If you knew that x was zero, then you would know that y being one is impossible is uh is improbable uh which is different from if you didn't know that x was zero in which case y being one is actually quite quite possible um and additionally you have this uh oh no not so it's kind of funny that in general um a y of zero and a y of one are just as likely but if you knew that x was zero then this situation is effectively eliminated, so it's much more likely that y is going to be zero in that case. All right, so we can start talking about conditional probabilities. Like, so how how do we have uh, how do we compute uh, conditional probability mass functions? Uh, so let's say we want the conditional probability mass function of y given that x is equal to little x, which I will denote by p y given x. And our inputs to this will be um, y given x. So we know that this is going to be uh, using basically how we've defined this before in chapter 2. This is the probability that x is equal to little x and y is equal to little y divided by the probability that x is equal to little x. But we can actually translate all of those probabilities into other functions. For instance, this is going to be the joint probability mass function for x and y. And the denominator is going to be the marginal distribution of x uh, evaluated at x. So the formula that you end up with in the end is going to be p of x, y uh, divided by p x of x. And similarly, uh, p of x given y Uh, is going to be the joint probability mass function of the two random variables divided by the probably the marginal distribution of y evaluated at y or the the marginal mass function whatever something like that okay so that allows us to talk about conditioning of random variables okay uh, so for instance if we wanted to know uh, what is the uh let's say, let's say we want to compute the probability that y is equal to uh let's say 2 given that x is equal to 1 that would be the joint probability mass function at uh 2 1 which is going to, uh, no at 1 2 because x is 1 so uh, x is 1 and y is oh that's not that's not a good example because it's going to be zero. So let's do instead. What's the probability that y is equal to one given that x is one? So uh, that would so let's see. We've got the joint probability mass function at one one, which is going to be point two divided by the marginal the marginal probability mass function of x at one which is uh, 0.3, so that'll be 0.2 divided by 0.3, which is 2 thirds, which for what it's worth is greater than uh, uh, 0.3, which was the, uh, which was just the, no, um, yeah, 0.3, which is the uh, conditional probability mass function of y. <laughs> at uh, 1. So basically what you're saying with this is that 
um, if x is 1, it's more likely that y will be 1 as well. So uh, that's a way you could possibly use these things or how you can work with them. Okay, uh, let's start seeing some examples. A fair six-sided die is rolled. Let x represent the number of pips shown. At the same time, a fair coin is flipped, and y will be 1 if the coin lands heads up, and it will be 2 if the coin lands tails up. So we need to figure out the joint probability mass function of x and y. Well, let's first think about the sample space. I mean, the sample space is being referenced here because I'm using this uh, omega, which is coming from the sample space. So I'm talking about something that comes from the sample space. So let's actually say what the sample space is. Remember when we're talking about random variables, this, this, these notions from chapter two about sample spaces and events, they never went away. They're still there. Sample spaces and events, like that stuff is still very much around. So what will this sample space consist of? Well, uh, we could say that the sample space consists of um, a combination of a die roll and a coin flip. So it might have, for example, um, a, a dice face. So this will be a dice face of one and heads or uh, another dice face and tails or an yet another dice face and maybe we'll make it heads this time All right and it's just going to keep going on like this so the question is how large is the sample space we're going to say that the sample space is well let's see we've got six dice faces and uh, two uh, possible values for the coin, hence or tails, so the size of the sample space is going to be 12. And we're going to say that everything in the sample space is equally likely. So if that's the case, uh, the joint probability mass function for x and y is going to be, we've got um, possible values for x, possible values for y. Everything in this table is going to be the uh, joint probability mass function. So x is the number of pips shown on the dice. So that can be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. y is 1 if the coin is heads up and 2 if it's tails up. So that's going to be possible values of 1 and 2. And all right, so if we are in this cell, then that means that the dice landed uh, up 1 and the coin was a head. So there's only one outcome that corresponds to this entry. So this will be 1 over 12. If we end up here, uh, then we're saying that the dice landed 2 uh, with uh, 2 pips showing and the coin landed heads up. And there's only one outcome in the sample space corresponding to this. So again, this will be 1 over 12. And actually, that's going to be the case for all of these, because if I were to go down to this cell, let's say, this is the probability that you got the dice with one pip showing and the coin was tails. So, again, there's only one outcome that corresponds with that, and there's uh, 12 possible outcomes. So everything in this table is going to be 1 12th. So... So we could say that everything in this table is the probability mass function. Or if we wanted to write this in a different way, we could say that P of X, Y is equal to one over 12. If um, X is an integer from uh, one to six, and uh, which I will say that's the same. So this notation means the same thing. This denotes numbers between one and six. And we need that y is a number between one and two. So I'll, I'll use the notation, the this uh, square bracket notation uh, to mean that y is a number between, uh, in, uh, that it's an integer that's either one or two. Otherwise, this probability mass function should be zero.
All right, uh, let's compute the probability that x is less than y. So the probability that x is less than y, well, possible values for y are 1 and 2. Okay, so if x is less than y, if y is 1, then this is impossible because x is at least 1, so nothing corresponds with the y where uh, y is uh, 1. So if y is 2, we could possibly get 1 pip on our die, so that should so that means that one possible outcome for this would be that x is 1 and y is 2 and then we would try like x is equal to 2 and it's like well that doesn't work because um because uh yeah you can't have x be at uh, equal to y so that leaves only p12 which is going to be 1 over 12 All right, let's compute the probability that both x and y are even. So what outcomes correspond to this? Y is probably going to be 2 the entire time. So, this, so that means we're going to have y always be 2. So that means that we need to think about what possible values x could be with this event happening. They both need to be even. So that would mean that x is going to be 2, 4, or 6. So we could have p2, 2 plus p2, 4 uh, plus, oh, no, 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 4, 2, sorry. The order does matter. So p4, 2, and then p6, 2, which is 1 12th plus 1 12th plus 1 12th which is one fourth because that's three twelfths. All right, uh, find the par marginal probability mass functions for both X and Y. Okay, the marginal probability mass function. So let's find it first for X. So this is going to be the sum over possible values of Y of P of X, Y, which is going to be the sum from Y equals one to two. Okay. So that's going to be the sum from y equals 1 to 2, 1 twelfth, which is 2 twelfths, which is 1 sixth, assuming that uh, x is an integer between 1 and 6. Okay? All right. Uh, that makes sense because we're talking about a die roll. Uh, if we're looking for the probably marginal probability mass function for y, that's going to be the sum over x of p of x, y. And x ranges from 1 to 6. So this is going to be the sum from x equals 1 to 6, 1 over 12, which is equal to 6 over 12, which is 1 half. And that's going to be true if um, y is an integer between 1 and 2. Ugh, darn it. Sorry about that. Okay, so... Okay, uh, well, let's just get rid of this. So, this is the case if y is, an, is the, either the integers 1 or 2. So, this should be 2. Otherwise, either one of these will be zero. All right, uh, next up, find the conditional distributions P of X given Y of X given Y and P of Y given X of Y given X. All right, so uh, for this one, uh, we should have um, that the P, that the, so let's see, we've got, uh, P of X given Y of X given Y. And this is going to be the joint probability mass function divided by uh, the marginal probability mass function for Y, which is going to be, well, if uh, Y is a number between one and two, so we should really only condition on events with positive probability. In principle, we could say, what's the conditional probability of x given y is equal to 3? 
I, I haven't explicitly forbidden that, but that's a really hard question to answer um, because basically we'd be dividing by zero. Uh, so you should probably not be or be very careful about um, dividing by events with zero probability. Although for what it's worth, every event that we like when we're talking about uh, conditional probability density functions, uh, well, in that situation, though, we're talking about density functions, and we are effectively conditioning on events that have probability zero, but we're allowed to do it there for some reason. All right, so, um, but when talking about discrete random variables, you should probably stick to things with positive probability. Anyway, the, probably, the joint probability mass function is going to be 1 over 12 uh, if uh, x is if uh, x is a number between 1 and 6. So I got 1 over 12 divided by uh, 1 over 2, which will be uh, 1 over 6. Which, notice that this is equal to the marginal probability mass function at x. That That's important. And uh, likewise, the marginal probability mass function of y given the value of x is going to be little x is going to be uh, 1 twelfth over 1 sixth, which is equal to 1 half, which is the marginal probability mass function of y. What these two facts suggest is that these two random variables are independent. So x and y are independent. Why? Well, that's the reason why is because uh, the probability that x is equal to x given y is equal to y uh, is equal to the probability of x equal, is equal to the probability that x equals x, regardless of whatever y is. So you have what you end up having is that the probability of some event a given b that ends up being the probability of A. Which we said before, that means independence. And that's going to be the case for every single uh, value, every single combination of X and Y. You always end up with this, so you end up with these random variables being independent of each other. <coughs> it's also true for, for, for Y in the Y direction as well. So X is independent of Y and Y is independent of X. All right. Uh, so in the package discrete RV, we are in fact able to define jointly distributed random variables. We have to basically give the um, probability mass function and uh, we give it to, so in order to define a jointly distributed uh, random variable, we need to feed a list to the function joint RV, which defines jointly distributed random variables. Um, and it lists, and this list has uh, possible values for X and possible values for Y. And then we give uh, this function uh, the the joint probability mass function. Uh, I think it's going to be, I think how this would work is, well, first off, this is the number 1 over 12, 12 times. But I think how this uh, function is understanding it is um, it's fixing x first and then trying values of y. So, yeah, it's... Uh, it's a little unclear if we didn't have necessarily an equal weighting, but uh, you could probably see the documentation to understand how exactly to set the probabilities. Anyway, um, so if we, we can in fact compute uh, marginal distribution, so marginal x, y, 1 will get you the marginal distribution of x. So that, and it tells you basically x is a die roll, and we can do the same thing for y as well. And then we can look at uh, the joint distribution, the joint probability mass function. And uh, it will say, okay, we've got a random variable with 12 outcomes. And by the way, for what it's worth, <coughs> when we create a random variable via marginal this way, the function does remember that the two random variables are related to each other. Um, so the so x and y it, it that those are still recognized as being jointly distributed random variables, okay, and which is kind of uh, which is kind of typified here uh, or indicated here, where it's actually giving you uh, 
uh, the probability of each combination of X and Y. And we could ask, what is the probability that X is in uh, the set C246 and Y is in the set two, which is the event that corresponds to both of those random variables being even. And it gives us a quarter as we got before. We can also get uh, the conditional distribution of X when we say that Y is equal to two, because this will, when working with these random variable objects, uh, indicate conditioning. And it does basically give us the conditional distribution when Y is equal to two. Um, uh, loading and I here created functions that can just uh, feed out con marginal uh, conditional distributions so we can say uh, so we can define a random variable of y given x when uh, x is 2 and and vice versa and get the distributions of these random variables okay uh, suppose that x and y are continuous random variables now much is the same. A lot of the stuff is the same. It's just we're going to replace probability mass functions with probability density functions. So for what it's worth, we're not going to end up dividing by zero because the probability density function should not be zero, right? Um, because even though we have zero probability events, that's not really what's going. That's not that's not what we're using. So uh, the mar so the probability density function satisfies this. The joint probability density function satisfies that the probability that the pair of the random variables are in some event A, and I hope you understand that this event A need not be rectangular. It could be quite strange. Um, like we are allowed, and hopefully you've watched. Uh, hopefully you're familiar with calculus three, and you've at least watched my video on it if you needed to, we are allowed to ask for the probability that the combination of these random variables and it will end up in this in this set. Right, we, we can ask what is the probability that we end up here or here? Right, so we are allowed for ask to ask the probability of strange events uh, with with interesting borders. So this will be the integral over the region a of f of x y. Uh, hold on. I'm too close to the edge of the screen. So this will be what, what you end up doing is you integrate the function f of x, y over the region a, which I'm going to denote like this, which means that you're probably going to need to think about the boundaries of that region, but we're just going to leave this for now. Notice though that the integral over or from negative infinity to, to infinity and negative infinity to infinity of f of x, y, dy, dx. That should be one because this is still a probability density function and probability density functions integrate to one. Okay, suppose we want the uh, marginal density function for x. That's going to be uh, the integral from negative infinity to infinity of f of x, y with respect to y. Which should make sense after seeing the discrete case because what you're effectively doing is adding up all the possible values of y and the probability of getting those y's. That's essentially what you're doing, right? So x in this case is treated as fixed. So you're trying to account for the probability that x that y is equal to any real number, right? So, uh, and the marginal distribution of y is defined similarly. So it's going to be an integral from negative infinity to infinity of uh, f of x y uh, dx. And of course, when I'm writing negative infinity to infinity, realize that this function. Oops. Uh, that this function uh, f, or any of these functions f, uh, could be jump functions, right? Like we're still, like at some point they're zero or along certain regions they're zero, and at other places they're not, they're not necessarily zero. 
Um, and you can still have jump functions in the plane. Like you can have a function that uh, is a zero everywhere except for a region where it's above zero. So you could you, you could still have something like that. You're still allowed that. Okay, and as for um, conditional density functions, so that would be like for example f of x given y of x given y. Technically, we we're asking for uh, a probability density function for x, assuming that y is equal to little y, which is a probability zero event. But we are still, in fact, allowed to do this for very deep reasons that are quite complicated and I'm not going to explain. <laughs> but basically, to get the conditional density function for x given y, you use the joint probability density function and then divide by the marginal density function for y. And similarly for y given x, this is going to be f of x, y, uh, divided by uh, f, x, x. Density functions are not probabilities, but they're kind of like probabilities. They're, they're very probability-like, so you, in many situations, get to use them in place of probabilities. All right, uh, next example. A company sells bags of deluxe mixed nuts containing almonds, cashews, and peanuts. One bag is five pounds, and the joint PDF for the amount of almonds and cashews Y in the bag is going to be, according to my notes, F of X, uh, Y, and this is going to be uh, a piecewise function. So it's going to be 24 divided by 5 to the power of 4. I found that to be the most convenient way to write this in calculations. X times Y. Mm. Let's have a better looking Y. All right. X times Y. If X is greater than or equal to 0, Y is greater than or equal to 0, and X plus Y is less than or equal to 5. And otherwise, this thing is zero. So this is just a joint density function for almonds and cashews. Uh, presumably, the amount of peanuts in the bag is 5 minus x minus y. So once you know how many almonds and cashew, cashews are in the, in the bag, you automatically know how many peanuts are in the bag, too. Uh, so the region on which this PDF is uh, non-zero, let's uh, illustrate that region. So we need to have that x is greater than or equal to 2, so we need to point this direction. We need to have, no, greater than or equal to 0. y needs to be greater than or equal to 0. And then x plus y needs to be less than or equal to 5. So let's put a 5 here and a 5 here. So let's draw the line x plus y equals 5. So x plus y equals 5. That would mean that y equals 5 minus x. So that's going to be uh, this line. And we need to be less than or equal to 5. Uh, so we need to be less than or equal to this line. Uh, so that's going to be this direction. So in the end, the region that we end up shading that represents the region over which this probability density function is positive is this triangular region here. Okay, uh, so customers uh, who are buying uh, bags of deluxe mixed nuts complain when 60% of the nuts in the bag are, are peanuts. Compute the probability that this occurs. Unfortunately, my uh, typesetting went, went off here. So uh, in, in my notes, I actually had a, a lot more space for this region, uh, for this uh, part that uh, unfortunately was uh, lost when I converted from single handout format to a book format. So we're just going to have to um, work with the space that we got. So um, anyway, so I want to compute the probability. <coughs> excuse me. I want to compute the probability that 60% of the nuts in the bag are peanuts. 
And this is going to be equivalent to the event. This is the probability that the sum of cashews and almonds divided by the total number of pounds in the bag. So you have the pounds of cashews and the pounds of olives. No, not olives, almonds. Uh, this is less than or equal to 0 0.4. That's equivalent to saying that uh, there's more than 60% of the bag being peanuts. Okay, so uh, this is equivalent to the probability that x plus y is less than or equal to 2 because you just multiply both sides by 5. All right, so what region corresponds to this event happening? If we were to sketch out our region, so x plus y is less than or equal to 2. This is the line x plus y equals 5. All right, x plus y is less than or equal to 2. That's going to be a similar line. So this line right here is x plus y is less uh, is uh, equal to 2, which is equivalent to saying that y is equal to 2 minus x. So that's going to be the line, and we need to be less than or equal to 2. So we're looking at uh, the red region below the line. That is the region over which, that, that is the region corresponding to our event. So if we want to compute the probability of that region, we're going to need to integrate our probability uh, density function over that region. So this probability is going to equal, all right, so uh, we need to figure out a way to represent this region in our integral. So what we could do is say, all right, let's uh, let's fix an x value. Uh, so we're gonna fix an x value. So to fix an x value, you draw a line, uh, a, a vertical line through some x, and then we're gonna ask where this line passes in and out of the region over which we are integrating. So it passes into the region at the line y equals zero and it passes out at the line y equals two minus x so if we are fixing x first then that means we are going to integrate x last so let's go ahead and write in uh, the formula for our probability density function over so 24 5 to the 4 xy we are fixing x first so we integrate with respect to y first and then to x second so we are fixing x the, the uh, x is going to range from 0 to 2 so that means that our outer integral is going to be from 0 to 2 and our inner integral will be from 0 to 2 minus x okay uh, we have a constant here so let's factor out the constant, 24 over 5 to the power, power 4. If we look at the inner integral uh, all by itself, it does not depend on x except, well, okay, we have a multiplicative x, so we could factor it out. Um, so let's uh, figure, factor out the multiplicative x, and then uh, we'll have the integral from 0 to 2 minus x. So the inner integral does depend on x, but it depends in the boundary. And then we have y dy uh, dx. So we integrate on the inside first. So this is going to be, um, we're going to have this be, let's see, we could, if we wanted to, change 24 to 12 and leave a 2 right here so that we have a nice clean antiderivative. So we'll get 12 over 5 to the power 4. And then we integrate from 0 to 2. And our antiderivative is going to be uh, y squared, where y ranges from 0 to 2 minus x. So we're going to end up with this being uh, 12 over 5 to the power of 4, the integral from 0 to 2. And we've got uh, 2 minus x squared, dx. All right, so now I need to figure out how to integrate that. I feel like probably the best thing to do would be to do u substitution to say u is equal to 2 minus x. So that means that du equals negative dx. 
the lower bound over which we're going to integrate is going to be 2 minus 0, which is 2, and the upper bound is going to be 2 minus 2, which is 0. So we end up with an integral with uh, improper boundaries where the lower bound is less than the upper bound. So all told, we end up with 12 over 5 to the power 4, uh, and then the inner negative 12 over 5 to the power 4 integral from 2 to 0, uh, u squared du. And the way we get the bounds in the right position uh, so that the lower bound is less than the upper bound is to remove the negative and uh, then flip. So why is that not erasing? Ugh, because it's being laggy. So, so 0 to 2. All right. So we're integrating from 0 to 2, u squared du. Uh, this is going to be a situation where if we pull out a 3 from our uh, from our outer term and leave 4 over 5 to the 4 and bring in a 3u squared, then we get a cleaner antiderivative. So this will be uh, the... So we got 4 over 5 to the 4, and then we've got... Um, the integral from 0 to 2, no. So u3, okay, so it almost looks like I got a negative sign right there. Let's clean that up. So we got u cubed, yeah. Yeah, so this will be, so this is equal to, no, this is multiplied with u cubed, where u is ranging from 0 to 2. And for what it's worth, 4, is uh, uh let's see um four is uh uh wait a minute these don't seem to be quite matching up oh 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 oops 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 i uh i made an error a long time ago there should be an X right here. My apologies. So, uh, yeah, there. So that was an error. We need to back up. Sorry about that. Um, okay. So, all right. So backing up. So those numbers were not going to quite match what I already written down. Okay. Sorry, there was an X that that I forgot about. Uh, so let's put that X back in. It it was uh, this X right here. Remember, we kind of pulled that out. So it still need to be in there. So that means that we're going to have um, 12 over 5 to the power 4. And uh, we're going to be integrating from 0 to 2. Uh, it'll be a 4x uh, minus 4x squared uh, plus x cubed uh, dx. And at this point, like, we could go through the trouble of computing that integral. Well, I don't know. At the, I, I guess this is a video, so if you don't want to see this next part, you can just skip ahead. Uh because now I'm just going to compute that integral just in case uh, some people watching it don't remember how to do it. So we will uh, say, all right, so this is going to be uh, 2x squared uh, uh, minus 4 thirds x cubed um, plus 1 fourth x to the power 4 and that's going to be going from 0 to 2, which is going to be uh, 12. That should be 12, right? Yes. Okay, so 12 divided by 5 to the power 4. And then we've got... Uh, we're going to have... So 8 minus... Um, to the power fifth, uh, two to the power five, over three, uh, plus, um, 
2 to the power of 3. And in the end, after you do uh, the mathematics, you should get in the end, after you do that algebra, or I guess it's arithmetic, not really algebra, it's going to be 7 times 2 fifths to the power of 4. And I'm willing to just leave it like that. You could, you could then plug it into a calculator to figure out what that is as a decimal number. Um, but I am content with this. All right. Okay, uh, next problem. Find the marginal distributions of x and y. Use this to comp compute the expected value of x, the expected value of y, the variance of x, and the variance of y, because those notions have not gone away. In fact, we're going to be expanding them in the next section. So I want to compute first the marginal distribution of x and y. Um, so fx... So, wait a minute. Okay. So, wait, okay, there we go. So, uh, fx x is equal to uh, 24 over 5 to the power of 4. And, all right, we need to be, we need to think very carefully about what we're integrating. So, we've got xy, and we need to respect, and we need to integrate with respect to dy. And now we need to figure out the bounds of the integration. The hard part of these types of problems is, Pretty much, I mean, aside from like manual labor, the hard part is generally figuring out what the proper bounds of integration are. Okay, so uh, we've got possible values of x and y. Here is the region over which uh, our PDF is positive, and we have x plus y is equal to five. That's the line that we're, we've written, which corresponds to. Um, y equals 5 minus x. So what that suggests is if we're going to be integrating with respect to y, we are fixing an x value. All right, so x is treated as fixed. And since we're fixing an x value, we pass through uh, the we pass through at the lower end y equals 0, so that'll be our lower bound, and we pass through at the upper end, y equals 5 minus x. So uh, that will be the upper bound. So there is our illustration and uh, the resulting integral. And now we need to compute that integral. Uh, we're not going to take out what x is because we're just treating x as fixed. We're going to end up with, in the end, an expression in terms of x. So this will be... Um, uh, well, let's see. If x is being treated as fixed, then this is a constant. So that constant can be factored out. And we can say this is, again, 12 over 5 to the 4, because I want to bring that 2 inside of the integral. And then we got x, and then we get, got an integral from 0 to 5 minus x. Uh, 2y dy. In which case, the, in, the antiderivative is easy. We've got 12 over 5 to the 4 uh, times x, and then we've got y squared, where y ranges from 0 to 5 minus x, which is going to be uh, 12 over 5 to the 4 multiplied with x times 5 minus x squared. And we also need some restrictions on x. Well, x is a number uh, between uh, 0 and 5. And we'll say that this is going to be 0 otherwise. So if if x is not between 0 and 5, then you're just going to say the PDF is 0. All right. So that's the marginal distribution for x. Uh, let's then compute the expected value of x. Uh, and uh, for the expected value of x, what we're going to do is say, all right, integrate from 0 to 5 x times the uh, the marginal probability density function for x with respect to x. And let's uh, go ahead and replace um, what those are. So that's going to be um, x. So we're, we've got 12 over 5 to the power of 4. x squared, 5 minus x squared. Okay. 
So 12 over 5 to the power of 4. x squared times 5 times x squared. Excuse me. Dx. Okay. Uh, so that is going to be... Uh, so that's going to be 12 divided by 5 to the power of 4. Uh, and then it's going to be... So for our antiderivatives... Um, we're going to have, well, we're, okay, what we're integrating is 25x squared uh, minus 10x cubed uh, plus x to the fourth dx, where x ranges from 0 to 5. And that is going to be 12 over 5 to the power of 4. Um, so we've got 25 thirds x cubed uh, minus 5 halves x uh, to the power of 4 plus x to the fifth power over 5. And this is ranging from 0 to 5 which will be uh, 24, uh, 12 over 5 to the power of 4. And we've got uh, 5 to the... And then this is all going to be multiplied by 5 to the power of uh, 5. And what's left inside is uh, 1 third minus 1 half plus 1 fifth. And in the end, that comes out to, after you do the arithmetic, uh, it equals 2. So you get to figure out why it equals 2. Okay. Uh, mm, we want to compute the variance as well. So we're going to compute the expected value of x squared, which is going to be the integral from 0 to 5. Uh, 12 over 5 to the power of 4 x cubed 5 minus x squared dx which is going to be 12 over 5 to the power of 4 integrating from 0 to 5 25 x cubed minus 10 um uh, x to the power of 4 plus x to the power of 5 dx okay which is equal to uh, so our antiderivative for this we got 12 over 5 to the power of 4 and our antiderivative will be 25 x to the power of 4 over 4 uh, minus 10 x to the power 5 over 5 plus x to the 6 over 6, ranging from 0 to 5. Uh, in this case, we're going to have this is uh, 12 over 5 to the power of 4 times 5 to the power of 6 times um, 1 fourth minus two-fifths plus one-sixth and then you do the arithmetic on that and you're going to get that the expected value of x squared is five a beautiful five all right so then when we compare compute the variance of x you're going to use the expected value of x squared uh, minus the mean of x Uh, squared which is 5 minus 2 squared which is 4 which is 1 so the variance of this thing is 1 which if you're curious that means that the standard deviation is 1 so 1 pound so it has a standard deviation of 1 of 1 pound and uh, well since uh, if you inspect this 
a joint probably density function and we were to repeat all this stuff in the case of y because we also wanted to find the marginal distribution of y there was nothing here where we were there was nothing that we did here that doesn't also apply to y in fact there's a term there is a term for what for the relationship between x and y it turns out that x and y are known as exchangeable random variables uh, but basically uh, you can you can verify for yourself that the marginal distribution of y is equal to the marginal distribution of x in a, in for all intents and purposes. So that means that the expected value of y is going to be uh, two, and the variance of y is going to be uh, one. All right, that was a lot of work. Moving on. Ooh, look at that page covered in math. So much math. Anyway, uh, find the conditional PDFs of X and Y, uh, of X given Y and Y given X, and use this to compute the probability that X is greater than two, given that Y is equal to two. Okay. Uh, this is also another one of those situations where the typesetting didn't work out quite right, unfortunately. And I just couldn't automatically turn this into a book. So the typesetting went bad here. So we'll just say everything below the blue line corresponds to this calculation. All right. So uh, the, uh, so the uh, conditional distribution of X given Y is going to be... Uh, well, let's see. We need to use the joint probability density function of x and y and then divide it by the marginal density function for y, which is going to be, uh, we'll have 2x divided by uh, 5 minus y squared um, if uh, x is greater than or equal to 0 y is greater than or equal to zero and x plus y is less than or equal to five and it's going to be zero otherwise okay so that's assuming that y is at some level of valid number two so um yeah it, like this this formula would start to break down if you chose say y equals six so from what so for a y strictly between zero and five there probably wouldn't be well, okay, yeah, for a y including zero, I guess, but also less than five, there wouldn't be a problem. Uh, but uh, otherwise, you should um, be. But otherwise, you probably should just not, not have, not be using this uh, formula. And similarly, because of these, uh, this exchangeability property, uh, because of because the function that the functions that we're working with are very symmetric with each other, the conditional distribution of y given x. It's just going to be the same thing. Like there was nothing, there was nothing that we did that doesn't also apply to y. So you could say that this is going to be the the conditional distribution of x given y, but just flip um, the parameter values. So it's it's going to be essentially the same thing. Now let's compute the probability that x is greater than two, given that y equals two. So the Conditional distribution of x given y is equal to 2. So x given 2 is going to be uh, 2x over 5 minus 4 squared. So this will be 2x um, if x is greater than or equal to 0. y is greater than or equal to 0, but y is 2. So that's automatically satisfied. And x plus... Uh, plus uh, 2 is less than or equal to 5, which is the same as saying that x is less than or equal to 3. So we could say effectively that x is going to be a number between 0 and 3. So, so if 0 is less than or equal to x, which is less than, we'll say it's strictly less than 3, and then 0 otherwise. So notice, maybe notice from this uh, uh 
from our previous work that why not only has an effect in the formula itself, but also on the boundaries. Why is affecting the boundaries over which this random variable works too? Uh, that's an interesting property of this PDF. So, um, all right, then I want to compute the probability that X is greater than two. So the probability that X is greater than two, uh, given that Y equals two, will be uh, the integral from two to three of our PDF of, uh, of X given Y, of uh, X given two, uh, DX, which is equal to, um, that is going to be the integral from two to three to X DX, which is equal to X squared, uh, running from two to three. Uh, although I feel like, well, I feel like I'm, mm, something doesn't seem right. Something doesn't seem, oh, oops, I, I screwed up. Um, uh, it's five minus two squared. <laughs> So five minus two is three. So this should be two over nine. Okay, there we go. Uh, I screwed up on in the denominator business. So this should be one over nine. No, 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 that's fine. That part was fine. So this should be one over nine. Okay, then we got one over nine, which will be, uh, oops. So this will be, equal to one ninth times uh, nine minus four, which is equal to five ninths. All right, so that's going to be the probability. All right. Long calculations. Okay, we say that two random variables, X and Y, are independent if and only if um, the joint probability density function um, uh, is equal to the product of the marginals or you can alternatively say that f of x y uh, of x uh, that the marginal of the conditional probability density function of x given y is equal to just the marginal probability density function of x. And similarly for y. Although I'm pretty sure that if you showed it for one, it's also true for the other. Is equal to f y y. And I wrote this down in terms of probably density functions, but exactly the same thing is true if you were to replace this with P so that you were talking about probably mass functions too. Like it's exactly the same thing. If you wanted to do that. Okay, uh, example three. Are the random variables in the previous two examples independent? Explain why or why not. Uh, so for example one, This is the example where you had a coin flip and a die roll, and they are and they are in fact independent because uh, the uh, the probability mass function or the joint probability mass function is equal to uh, one over twelve, which is equal to one sixth times one half, which is equal to the marginal probability mass function for x times the marginal probability mass function for y at those particular x and y's. And this is going to be the case for whenever um, x is a number between 1 and 6, including just the integers, and when y is an integer between 1 and 2. And otherwise, it will be 0. Even if be, even if, because if you were to say uh, x is 3, but y is 3, 
then while the probability mass function for x would be 1 sixth, the probability mass function for y would be 0, and thus it multiplies to 0. So, so these are, in fact, uh, independent random variables, which was probably what you suspected from looking at how those random variables were being generated. Um, I should probably mention that when talking about independence, this formula right here is generally the more useful. But that's generally more useful. It's that that it isn't always like you could probably come up with situations where the other one is more useful. Like for example, what I'm about to do. Uh, example two. That was the one where we had uh, bags of peanuts and such. And in this case, no, they are not independent. Which is so if we were to look at uh, the joint probability density function for these random variables, that's going to be um, 24 over 5 to the power of 4, and you have x, y, and it looks almost like, well, couldn't you factor these two, like x and y are multiplying together, isn't it possible to factor them out into separate uh, probability density functions? And the answer is no, and the reason why is because of the boundaries. You have x greater than or equal to 0, y greater than or equal to 0, and x plus y is less than or equal to 5. It is this latter part that causes them to not be able to factor, and it causes them to be dependent on each other. All right. So, and then otherwise, this is 0. If we were to multiply um the marginal probability density functions for x and y the product would be uh, 12 squared over 5 to the power 8 and then we would have xy times 5 minus x squared times uh, 5 minus y squared if um, if a, a 0 was less than or equal to x which is less than or equal to 5 and 0 is less than or equal to 5 which is less than or equal to y so no, uh, no 0 is less than or equal to y which is less than or equal to 5 so not only do you not have this dependence in the boundary you have a square boundary instead which one way to know automatically if two continuous random variables, or it even applies for for discrete random variables too. Uh, if there is if if the region on which these two random variables are supported, if if or by support I mean this is where their probability density function or probability mass function is a uh, uh, non-zero. If that's going to be a square region, then they could possibly be independent. But if it's not square, they are not independent. So since this is a triangular region on which these two random variables live, since that region is triangular rather than square, and when I say square, I mean, or, or not necessarily square, but rectangular, um, it needs to be parallel to the x and y axis. So whatever random variables had this as the region over which um, they, uh, uh, over which they in some sense live, uh, where their probably density function is greater than zero, if they had this, they could potentially be independent of each other. But if it, but if it were say uh, this diamond shape, no, they're not. They are not independent of each other. So, and and when I say rectangular, I I do in fact allow for the boundaries to be infinite. So we can have infinite boundaries and things. And, and that's still considered rectangular, but you cannot have any sort of triangular type boundary and the random variables be independent at the same time. Okay, so this by so this right here, the resulting function when you multiply the uh, marginal density functions together, that is not equal to the joint. And that would have to be the case in order for these to be jointly distributed. Turns out um, this uh, discrete RV package, if you have two random variables, um, 
defined as we as I did above, you can ask the discrete RV package whether they're independent or not, and it will tell you whether it is. Um, so, uh, general, it is possible to generalize all the stuff that we've been talking about from two random variables to n random variables x1 to xn. Uh, so the uh, probability that a collect that this uh, collection of random variables is in some set a is going to be well let's break it up into a couple cases if discrete and continuous so if they're discrete then it's going to be the sum over possible values of x1 to xn where that where that combination is in the set a you're going to add up their uh, joint probability mass function because you can define a joint probability mass function for for all of them so this is if discrete and if you have continuous random variables it's going to be the integral over that region so f of x of their joint density function Uh, so this will be the case if if these random variables are continuous. Uh, you can have oh boy. You can define their uh, marginal uh, distributions. So for example, if I wanted, if I were working with. Uh, uh, sorry, I'm just looking at this formula and dreading it. <laughs> okay, so um, let's say, like, okay, honestly, this is a part that you could probably skip over if you. I I, I don't know how much how much this is gonna be. This is gonna matter, but let's say that you wanted to get the joint uh, probability density function for some sub collection of these random variables. So, uh, X, I, K. So this is a sub, in, uh, so this is a, uh, a sub collection of the collection of random variables. So there are, so there are K random variables in the subset. What you do in general, and uh, let's throw in our indices, X, I, one, uh, X I K. Uh, what you do in the case of continuous is integrate uh, over the real real numbers all the other random variables out. So we have the joint probability density function for all of the random variables, and uh, integrate out all of the random variables that are not in your subcollection. So d, x, j, um, n minus k. So the index sets um, i1 to i k and, uh, and uh, j1 J n minus k. These index sets are disjoint, but their union is going to be so i one uh, to i k, and their union j n minus k. Their union is going to be the uh, the numbers one through n. Okay, so this is the case for continuous. Uh, for discrete, it's going to be very similar, except you're going to be summing. And finally, you have um, uh, you can have a conditional probability density function. So x i one um, 
to x i k. So again, we have some uh, uh, we have some uh, uh, sub collection of random variables, and then we've got x i one to x i k. And then this is given some other random variables x j one. Oh, I think at this point in my notes. Uh, JL. I think at this point in my notes, I just said this is equal to stuff. I gave up. <laughs> but basically, you can. All right. Long story short, for this section, is you can do all of this for general collections of random variables. Uh, in general, now there is one idea that actually is quite important. We say that x1 and xn, these are independent if for every uh subset of random variables xi1 to xik we have that the marginal density functions or mass functions whatever if the joint <coughs> excuse me if uh the uh, joint probability mass or probability density function um of these random variables If we wanted to get that, and these are co uh, independent random variables, it's going to be the product of their marginal distributions or their marginal density or mass functions. And the idea of having a collection of random variables be independent is extremely important uh, when we're moving on to uh, when we're moving on to talking about like the law of large numbers of the central limit theorem or just how statistics are working because statistics are usually assuming that your data is not just independent. Uh, if each of these random variables are independent and they each have the same probability mass function or probability density function, then they are said to be an independent and identically distributed sample, uh, which is often abbreviated with the term IID. This is a very common assumption about data sets, and it's, a, it's an assumption that we're going to be using uh, later on. Okay, so uh, an example. Let's compute the probability that the minimum of all of these random variables is greater than or equal to some number x if these random variables are iid. So uh, this is a very fancy trick that I saw once. So I want to compute the probability that the minimum of the random variables this minimum needs to be greater than or equal to some quantity x. And this is going to be identical to the event that x1 is greater than or equal to x and x2 is greater than or equal to x and so on. xn uh, is greater than or equal to x. So all of these, if, if the minimum is greater than or equal to x, then that means that every single one of these random variables is greater, greater than or equal to x. And these random variables are all independent. So that breaks into the probability that x1 is greater than or equal to x times the probability that x2 is greater than or equal to x. And we're just going to keep going on like this. And we know what all those probabilities are. It's going to be, uh, we should assume actually that these are continuous. So say these are continuous uh, random variables um, x. So they're continuous random variables. It just makes it easier if we assume that. Um, it's not like we couldn't work with discrete random variables at this point, but I just don't want to think about it. So this will be one minus the CDF at X because that's what one of these are. Uh, so this is equal to one minus the CDF of X one at X. And since all of these are equal to each other, because these are IID random variables. So these are all equal because the random variables are independent and identically distributed. So it's the identically distributed part that causes them to be equal. The independent part causes them to multiply. So this will be one minus F of X to the power N. Because we multiplied th this out N times. All right. And uh, to wrap this uh, section up, uh, we're going to introduce another distribution called the multinomial distribution. 
With a multinomial distribution, we have R categories, and we have a single observation, and, and a single observation belongs to category I, uh, with I being one of the those R categories, and it belongs to that category with probability PI. We count how many observations belong to the category I. This gives XI. Then the vector, X1 to XR, or the tuple if you prefer, uh, follows the mul multinomial distribution. And the probability mass function of the multinomial distribution with parameters P1 to PR is going to be P, well, so here's its probability mass function, P of X1 to XR, and it's going to be N choose X1 uh, x2 dot 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 uh, xr p1 to the power x1 dot 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 so we have a whole bunch of multiplication pr to the power xr uh, and this is for uh, non-negative uh, x1 all the way to XR, uh, or let's say, uh, and, and also integer. So these need to be integers too. X1 to XR uh, with the with these random, well, they're not random, with these numbers summing up to the uh, to to n. Okay, uh, and also to tell you what that formula means, n choose x1, uh, x2, dot, 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 xr is equal to n factorial divided by x1 factorial, x2 factorial, times x2 factorial, times, dot, 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 times xr factorial. Which is cut so this formula or, or this uh this quantity here is a generalization of of uh n choose k. And what we're saying here is this probability mass function is non-zero um when you've plugged in basically a possible valid count. Because we're what we're doing with this random variable is we are we have possible categories and we are counting how many times uh, each category shows up in the data set. If we're counting up the number of way number of times each category um, appears in the data set, then the total sum of all of these categories is going to be n because there were n observations, and um, the probability of seeing each one individually uh, had probability pi. So you had to multiply pi. Um, the number of times it was actually observed in the data set and then multiply all those together to get the probability of getting a particular string. After that, we would then count the number of strings possible where uh, each category shows up in the uh, x1, x2, xr times. So that's how you would interpret this formula. Okay, uh, so it's this multinomial distribution, by the way, is actually a generalization of the binomial distribution. The binomial distribution tracked only successes and failures. The multinomial distribution allows for more categories than just success or failure. So you end up with this generalization. The, the uh, binomial is actually a subset of the multinomial where um, x where uh, r is equal to 2. And P, another requirement is that uh, p1, uh, so, so all of those probabilities, p1 to pr, so we need to have those. All of those need to add up to one. So in the case of the the binomial, r was equal to two. So p r, which was p two, was equal to one minus p one. So it was just kind of left out because you, if you knew how many successes there were, you automatically knew how many failures there were. But in this situation where there's multiple categories, uh, it, it's it's a little bit more complicated than that. So you need to be a bit more explicit about how often stuff is showing up. Okay, so that concludes this section. Uh, in the next section, 
we're going to keep talking about probability. We're going to be talking about expected values, covariance, and correlation in this uh, higher dimensional setting. So, uh, all right, uh, this was a long one, but it was an important section, and uh, I will see you later.